You are listening to episode 64 of Paz de Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors, and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world, championing Mexican food. You can find more information about my podcasts, my work, publications, and subscribe to my newsletter on my website, pazichipotle.com. Or you can simply click the link that is on this episode's notes. Chilling greetings, my lovelies. All things considered, I really hope that fall is treating you well. The last harvest season of the year is in full swing, and Mexican fields in the central region, where I am at the moment, are dotted with the evocative golden colors of marigold and the deep burgundy of coxcomb flowers. The very landscape announces the imminent arrival of one of Mexico's most beloved and complex traditions, that is Dia de Muertos. In previous years, I have written and produced themed episodes about this celebration, but I wanted to take a fresh look at it and explore its cultural history under a slightly different lens. And coincidentally, I was recently commissioned the production of a little Dia de los Muertos video crafted for the community of Puente Latino, which is a charity based in Long Beach, California. So I decided to make an adaptation of this project for audio, but really wanted to keep in mind the purpose to introduce little people to the rites and funeral practices of Mexico which of course touches on the commonality of our human condition dealing with mortality, mourning and remembrance. After all, the Day of the Dead celebration is a cultural pillar of Mexico's rituals of memory, conviviality and spirituality. And the contagious joy of the vibrant decorations, foods and music that give this celebration its very distinctive character, well, it transcends languages, borders and even beliefs around the world. People identify this fiesta as one of Mexico's most joyous cultural exports. It also shows the deep and multi-layered cultural roots of the imagery and objects that we can find in altars and offers an approach that allows to have a comfortable framing of this tradition of which we are so proud of. In the notes of this episode, you will find the link to enjoy the visual version, which is the original one that I created for Puente Latino, and a few extras that I'm sure you will enjoy. Before we get started, I am also very excited to share some backstage action. So I am currently working on a Mexican-inspired Christmas wish list featuring inspiring cookbooks, films, delicious novels and gripping history books, among other things. It will also feature the passionately crafted products and creations of previous guests and friends of the show with special discounts for you to take your holiday foodie adventures to a whole new level of deliciousness. I will be sharing updates over Instagram and Twitter. And of course, if you want to get it before anyone, well, you better sign up to my newsletter. Links and all, of course, of course, are on the notes of this episode. Well, get a nice cup of something nice because we are about to start. I hope you enjoy this episode. Día de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. 
is such a special time of the year for us here in Mexico and also for everyone around the world who, like you, carries a little piece of Mexico in your heart. Let's begin by saying that life is wonderful. Is feeling the warmth of the sunshine on your skin when you open your arms or closing your eyes very tight when you are giving a very squeezy hug to someone you have really missed. Us humans love life so much that we find it very difficult when we have to say goodbye forever to someone we love. And that is why there are hundreds of different ways in which people around the world perform funeral rituals and have special ways to honor the memory of the dead. Even at the dawn of humanity, when people didn't have a language to communicate the way we do, they shared and experienced deep feelings of loss and sadness. Their funeral rites tell a very moving story of love and attachment to the people that had a special place in their lives. And these archaeological findings also tell us that they were very likely to experience these events as a community, finding comfort in each other. You see, throughout history, all around the world, from the Egyptians, Chinese tribes, Vikings, North American First Nations, Mayan, Aztec, and many other cultures, will they all come up with special ways to say the last farewell to the people they loved, and also created tales, myths, and stories to tell their children about their ancestors so they could hear from them even when they were gone. Our modern world is really not too different when it comes to these traditions. People from different countries have their own way to honor their dead. But there is something very special that you have to remember when it comes to the ceremonies to commemorate people that passed away, friends, family members, veterans, and why not even our beloved pets. It shouldn't really be their absence that we remember but rather their lives, all those happy and special moments that bring a smile to our faces. It is actually that what we should always celebrate. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, before the parents of our grandparents were born here in Mexico, the ancient indigenous tribes came up with their own unique way to make sense of life and death to explain the origin of the universe and figure out a way to keep the memory of their ancestors alive. I am almost certain that many of you have seen Day of the Dead altars, which are called ofrendas in Spanish, and I bet you are familiar with some of the objects that go in them, like sugar skulls, special breads, and cut-out paper. And surely you have wondered where did this idea come from? Who thought of creating these altars, and what is the point of making them? Well, to answer these and a few other questions I myself have wondered, let me take you back in time to see how this tradition took shape. Mexico is a country that has a very long history that goes back for thousands of years. And long before the Spanish conquistadors ever set their eyes on this land, in this territory, there were many different tribes. In fact, as far as we know, there were 68 of them that spoke different languages, had different religions and their particular ways of life. But they did have a few things in common, like the foods they ate, the constructions they built, the way they dressed, and also similar ways in which their rituals helped them create a sense of togetherness. And very important for us today, they shared the notion that our souls carry on existing forever and ever, but in different forms and in different worlds. You see, the Mexica, or Aztec people, were, at some point, the largest tribe of all, so much so that they created an empire. 
and they believed that there were many gods and each of them had a special influence upon the forces of nature, like the wind, rain, the sun and water. And they believed that some deities, that means gods, also ruled over life and death. The Mexica came up with the idea that when someone died, that person's spirit had to go through a long journey into the underworld of the dead that was called Mictlan. In their mythology, this world was ruled by the gods Mictlantecutli and his wife Mictecatzihuatl. And because this was an otherwise unknown and mysterious place, the Mexica believed that only the pure nature of the innocent spirit of a Xolos Quintle, which is a hairless dog from Mexico, could guide the souls and protect them through the long journey through different levels, until they met with the gods of the underworld. They paid their respects and after that they were granted permission to come back into this world of the living but just temporarily and some of them did so in the form of guardian spirits and some even took the shapes of animals. For instance, it was their belief that all those warriors who died in battle will be able to come back in the form of a hummingbird. Meanwhile, in the actual world of the living, the indigenous people believed that in spite of not having the physical presence of their loved ones, certain religious rites and ceremonies would allow them to summon the spirits of their ancestors so they could share and enjoy, just for a few precious days, the company and love of their families. And this is precisely what ofrendas or altars are all about. The indigenous people really thought that they were all children of Mother Earth, and by using elements that were in nature, like water, wind, fire and earth, they could create a symbolic union, like a bridge between the world of the living and the world of the dead. We know, thanks to many archaeological works, that altars contained many objects, including seeds, foods, ceremonial incense burners and flowers. But also, there were personal belongings from the deceased people to whom this altar or burial was dedicated to, like spears, arrows, tools and even jewelry. A long time ago, 499 years to be precise, the Spanish invaded what is today Mexico and turned this territory into a colony of Spain. That means that they forced the native people to accept the Spaniards as the new owners and rulers of the land, which I'm sure you can imagine, it didn't make people very happy. They also forced the natives to learn Spanish and forget about their religion, instead to convert to their Christian faith, which was Catholicism. The whole transition into a new way of life was very slow and complicated, but luckily for us, they found a way to negotiate their traditions in a manner that the culture of Spaniards and indigenous people were both present through language, music, celebrations, ways of farming, and of course, food. And so, ofrendas or altars, along with many other traditions, had a very big transformation that made room for the Spaniards' Catholic beliefs. So we can even say that the indigenous people taught the Spaniards how to communicate with their dead and how not to be in a permanent state of mourning or even never speaking about them again, but instead by creating and dedicating a special few days every year to honor the life of their lost ones, they will be together and continue their union. And that is how every year from October the 28th to November the 2nd, we celebrate Dia de los Muertos. Now, there are two places where people prepare special altars and arrangements for the dead. And one of them are cemeteries. It is a tradition here in Mexico that we get together with our families and visit graveyards or cemeteries to clean the tombstones of our relatives. We make a small altar on top of them, put flowers, 
burn incense and sometimes people also bring the foods and drinks that their relatives used to enjoy when they were alive and they all share them as a family while they stay there at the cemetery. We feel sad, yes, of course, but we also try to cheer and comfort each other with nice anecdotes and stories because we really believe that the spirits do come back to be reunited again and we don't want them to feel forgotten or sad. So we even play music and sing. It is not uncommon at all to see mariachi, norteño or even marimba bands at cemeteries. Now, at home, it is a very different story. For each of these days, we prepare something special and the altars are constructed in many styles, sizes and types. And there are also loads of different elements that go in them. In central Mexico, where I am from, altars tend to have several levels, much in the style of a pyramid. And they can have up to seven levels and each of them is smaller in size as they go higher and higher. We can distinguish three groups of objects that we place at these altars. Some are ornaments, just to make the altar look pretty and attractive for us and for the spirits, with things like cut out paper and flowers. Other objects have a ritualistic aspect to them. Some of these things are water, sugar skulls, incense, candles and food. And last, we also include personal objects that belonged to our loved ones. Now, I mentioned that the celebrations last for several days and each of them is dedicated to remember different groups of people. And this is how it works. On October the 28th, we prepare altars for all those people who died during accidents or that had a sudden and not very nice death. On October the 29th, we commemorate all the people who died drowned. Now, historians think this is because many centuries ago, when the cities were quite small here in Mexico, there were still many rivers around and during the rainy season, floodings were a common problem. So surely many people must have died as a result of this, so much so that they decided to dedicate a special day to remember them. But don't worry, thankfully today this is really not a problem anymore, but we still carry on this tradition. On October 30, we honor the souls of long lost relatives, those that we never got to meet and no one even remembers their names. Also, we dedicate this day to the people who had no families and no one to think about them. On October the 31st, we prepare special foods and place things like toys and baby clothes to remember the souls of babies who died before birth or just after being born. And on November the 1st, we continue honoring the little ones, but this time older children that for some reason left this world too soon. And last on November the 2nd, we honor the lives of all souls, young and old, those who died recently and those who died a long, long time ago. Even we keep a little place in our altars to honor the memory of our pets. Now, let me tell you a bit more about some of the special ritualistic elements that go in many Day of the Dead altars. And quite a few of them have an ancient indigenous origin, which makes them extra special. The burning of incense and copal. These two are resins from trees that grow in our forests. We collect the resin and then burn it in special burners. The smell is very aromatic and our ancestors believed that this smoke had the power to cleanse the houses from negative energy and to prepare it for the souls to visit and feel welcome and at peace. We also burn candles or oils. Indigenous people believed that this special fire will serve as a guide, like a lighthouse or a beacon for the souls to find their way back home and return from the world of the dead. 
A long time ago, indigenous people used the actual bones of their loved ones that were carefully cleaned and placed on the altars, and that is how they honored them. Spaniards didn't feel very comfortable with this, as you can imagine, but taking inspiration on this idea, they created special breads and sweets with the shape of bones and skulls, and that is how hojaldras and many other types of Day of the Dead breads were invented. And one of my favorite Mexican, Spanish, or mestizo invention are edible sweet skulls made with amaranth seeds mixed with sugar and honey. Also, some are made with chocolate. And the most popular are made with sugar. They are decorated with sugar paste that is dyed in bright colors. And when we buy these skulls at special sweet shops and markets, we get one for each person that we are going to honor in our altar. And we even have their names written with sugar paste. Cut out paper is also a somehow modern element because it was really only in the 1930s when people in the town of San Salvador, Huixcolotla, here in my home state of Puebla, they started creating beautiful and intricate designs using colored tissue paper to create them. And they became so popular that now People use these creations to decorate altars, parties, and we like them so much that we have them made in special colors for weddings as well. Another important element that goes in our altars is, of course, food. People know, of course, that spirits can't actually sit and eat the way we do, but we believe that they can feed of the essence, the smell, the warmth, and the love we put into the making of these special foods. So many people go as far as making breakfast, lunch and dinner and change it every day for the duration of these celebrations. And there are three popular flowers that many people use to put on the altars. The most famous of all is of course Sempasuchitl or Marigold with its beautiful deep orange color, round shape and very intense perfume. We place them in vases to adorn the altar, but also we make a path using the petals all the way from our house's front door to the altar. The other two popular flowers are Baby's Breath or Nube as it is called in Spanish, and cock's crest or terciopelo flowers that have an unusual but very beautiful shape and texture. During the 1800s lived a famous caricaturist called José Guadalupe Posada. He had a very particular style because he used a technique called engraving, which requires carving wood or metal plaques, then cover them with a special ink and press them against a sheet of paper. And he created a special character that first appeared on a newspaper. And this was a skeleton dressed up as a very elegant woman with a fancy dress and a hat with flowers and feathers, and he named her as Katrina, which means elegant lady. Instead of being scared or put off, people really loved this engraving so much that from that moment onwards, many other artists copied the style and created all sorts of ornaments that are still very popular to this day. In the 1900s, when photography made its commercial debut, that meant that people, whether they were rich or poor, could afford to have their portrait taken. So when they passed away, their families had these photographs to remember them exactly as they were. And families started using this modern form of art to place it at the altars. And with this, they gave them a special meaning and turned them into a special ritualistic object. This is a practice that we still carry on to this day. 18 years ago, in 2008, the United Nations declared Dia de los Muertos as cultural heritage of mankind. That means that around the world people recognized the beauty and importance of this big tradition from Mexico. And now, thanks to social media, television and streaming services, the world can get to learn and be inspired by our culture. 
And of course, Mexicans have also borrowed a few ideas from other countries. We can say that marketing has a lot to do with this, but ultimately, each of us decides what to adopt and how to do it. That is why it's not uncommon to see in Mexico a mix of Halloween and Mexican Day of the Dead decorations, and some people even dress up, although we don't really do trick-or-treating the way it's done in the US. When done respectfully, I think that borrowing from different cultures is a great way to recognize the richness in the expressions of other people and their ways of life. And also I think it's very, very important to get to know what is behind those traditions, the history and the ways in which they took shape and what they mean to people, just as we have done today. So whether you make an altar at home, paint your face in the style of a Katrina or a sugar skull, make Day of the Dead bread, or however you want to celebrate, you should feel proud that you are contributing to keeping this tradition alive, also by making it your own and giving it your personal touch. I know that in the previous episode I promised you legends and I will not fail you. You see, storytelling and oral history are hugely important in Mexican culture. And of course, legends have a very special place in our family traditions. But I do have to warn you that if you are listening to this episode with young children around, perhaps you might want to skip this section just about now. Between you and me, I have a soft spot for eerie lore tales of horror, terror, paranormal stuff and everything in between. <laughs> and one of our most spooky legends is perhaps the legend of La Llorona or the crying woman. And if you've never heard about it, well, you're gonna hear about it now. Lost in time are the origins of this strange legend. Some say it goes back to the ancient indigenous myths Others say it is based in real events that occurred in the colonial period. There are many local variations of this legend, but all coincide in the core story that goes like this. A young couple was madly in love, but they were sadly separated by the social prejudices as she was poor and he was from a wealthy family. Nevertheless, they decided to stay together, and a product of that love were two beautiful children. But this dream didn't last long, because the mother was suddenly abandoned by her lover, who went off to marry someone else. She was consumed by sadness and anger, and in a mad act of despair, she took her children to a nearby river and drowned them. After doing so, she came out of that trance-like state and realized the horrific act she had just committed. And so, she could not bear it any longer and kill herself by also drowning in the river. From that day onwards, people claimed to hear the desperate cries of a distraught mother crying, Ay, mis hijos or something like, oh, my children. And it was doomed to forever roam this world, mourning the loss of her children. Dun, dun. <laughs> Pretty much every region in Mexico has their own version, and even point out to specific locations where the cries can be heard and where the alleged murders were committed. So, either we have hundreds of Lloronas, or we are a particularly haunted country. 
<laughs> but wait, wait, wait. I have another sort of kind of related story about it. And this is actually a family story. It didn't happen to me. I've never experienced any paranormal activity. But when my paternal grandparents were dating in the 1930s, they used to take evening walks from the School of Medicine, where my grand Rebecca was studying, to her house that was in the very old side of town in the city of Puebla right at the bottom of the Aquayamatepec hills. You might have never heard this name before, but you will recognize the context. So, one particular cold night, my granddad had kissed her goodnight after chatting for about an hour at the door of her house. And then he took off, walking up the hill to visit a friend of his that lived near there. He started walking in the middle of a long park locally known as Paseo de San Francisco, near the old river San Francisco. And he noticed that it was completely empty and eerily dark, except for a few dim lights in the distance. So he wrapped up in his coat and started walking. He then noticed that a chill wind swirled around him and he heard dead leaves ruffling all around. He turned backwards and it all went quiet and still. Continuing his way up, the same thing happened several times, making him feel more and more uncomfortable. And the last time he turned, he saw the fainting image of a woman in white that vanished in the direction of the river. He stood frozen and surprised for a moment, only to realize that he was at the top of the hill between the two forts of Guadalupe and Loreto, missing his friend's house for a few hundred meters. Needless to say that he never stayed that long and that late after that evening. Generations of people who had lived on the Aquayamatepec hill or in the vicinity have for hundreds of years reported the sound of panicked horses rushing and gunshots, shadow figures and apparitions of men dressed in all military attire. You see, this hill was a very place where thousands of French soldiers and members of the Mexican Republican Army fought a fierce battle in the eventful day of May 5th, 1862. Locals also report sights of French army men that appear to dig or look for something on the ground, as it is believed that many of them buried whichever valuable objects they carried with them, and even, as ghosts, desperately try to find their old lost treasures. Closing down this episode, I really hope that you got to see how flexible cultural traditions can be and how throughout the many commonalities that we share across cultures, Dia de los Muertos has captivated the world's imagination and has even inspired people to dress up as hybrids of Katrina and Frida Kahlo and even wearing Mexican-inspired costumes. Now, without falling into the trap of heritage puritanism that will criticize any attempt of lending inspiration or altering in any way, shape or form these cultural expressions, we must understand that all cultures and all identities are consequences of the constant flow of ideas, exchange and transformation. So if you want to give a proverbial hat tip to another culture, whichever the context, make sure to do it in a way that is respectful and dignified. Now, without a doubt, we can say that by far Dia de Muertos remains a cultural pillar for all Mexicans, because unlike any other tradition, this speaks to our very core and essence of what defines us as a multi-ethnic mestizo nation. One that we are very very proud of.
Thank you for listening. This episode was written and produced by me, Rocío Carvajal. And I have loads of goodies for you. So first, on the notes of this episode, you will find a link to download the Day of the Dead document I created for Puente Latino that includes my recipe to prepare candied pumpkin, which is a seasonal treat. And it also includes some fun cutout paper inspired designs that you can print out and color. There is also a link to a Dia de los Muertos themed YouTube playlist with music and songs by Mexican artists. And also I included other songs that I think you will enjoy. And because I'm sure there are a few horror fans out there, you will also find the link to check a super spooky Mexican movie. And it was inspired in the legend of La Llorona or the crying woman. And it is called Kilometro 31 or Kilometer 31. To top it all up, here is a very special treat. You can use the promo code SUGARSKULL, all together, one word, to get a 15% off in all of my ebooks. And last, remember to give me a follow on Instagram or Twitter to stay tuned for all the updates about my super duper fabulous ultimate Mexican inspired Christmas wish list. Well, <laughs> That's it for today, my friends. Take care, you all, please. Until the next time. <laughs>